This building has always been called the museum, but it never looked like a museum before. And the original building was the same square footage the, uh, as this building is now, but it's, it's configured differently. Before, there were three rooms. There was the classroom, the lab, and then kind of a, a room that got used for a number of things over the years, from a music room to a, a home school for some of the parents and so forth. So when they built the new museum, it, it, they built it to be the same square footage. And one of the things that I really wanted to do with this building was to, to make it into a, into a museum. And it's still a work in progress. There's a lot of things around that can go in here. Uh, the photographs on the walls are from the archives, and they go back to the beginning of the school. The um, barrister bookcases that are in here now, when the library was first built in 1917, all of the books were encased in these enclosed bookcases. None knew that the desert was dusty. And so he, he had bookcases for, for all of the books in the library. A few years ago, a couple of years ago, uh, we had a a uh, science professor that came, and he still will continue to teach ongoing. His name's Robley Williams. He's just uh, a retired science professor. And when he was a child, his father uh, taught here. And so he grew up, part of his growing up was at, at Deep Springs. When he first came, he went into the laboratory and came to me and said, you've got some incredible antique scientific uh, machinery in here. And I said, we know that, but we don't know what they were used for. We don't know anything about them. Is there any way you could identify them for us, and then we can put them in the museum? And he said, sure. And then he never said another thing until the day that he was leaving at the end of the semester. He came and he said, Linda, come. I want to show you what I've done. So he brought me in here, and he had taken all this machinery, uh, uh, all this scientific equipment, had annotated it, made uh, a catalog of the things, one for in here and one for in the archives, had cleaned everything up and displayed them here in this case, and then there are a number in these cases over here too. A lot of the stuff that's in these bookcases are just uh, desert treasures, is what uh, we call them. And, and, you know, there's old nails, there's old bottles, they're just things that, have, that people have found out in the desert, mixed in with some of the scientific equipment stuff. The old insulators from off the poles around here, uh, when they have replaced them, some of these go back uh, and are very, very old. Then, um, over in this corner here, uh, these bookcases are full of a lot of sewing stuff. A couple of times since I have been here, the students have wanted to sew. And they mainly want to patch things. And so I devised um, a non-credit sewing class where the students would come and out of the old Levi's from the bone pile, and the bone pile is where everything gets dumped when the students don't want them any longer. Uh, so out of those, the students would make a quilt from, uh, from pieces of the old uh, Levi material. And they're really quite fun. Uh, there's uh, a number of them have done it and, and uh, have had a good time. It's, and they've learned how to use a sewing machine, how to do top stitching, how to put a seam together, and various other things through that. And then this room also is our largest classroom. And this is where the summer seminar meets every summer. All of the students in the summer take the same class. It's the entire first year new class that come in July, and uh, half of the second year class who are here. The other half will be on break at that time. So this becomes a very crowded and busy classroom. These things here came out of the, uh, the attic in the barn, or the hayloft in the barn. Uh, an old pack frame, an old saddle of, uh, of one of the uh, early cowboys that worked here. These are the collars for the horses when, they, when all of the haying and so forth was done with real horsepower. And uh, there are other things up there that I'll eventually bring down too. But just 
uh, again, to give this room the feel of really being a museum. A lot of the furniture that Nunn decorated the Deep Springs with in the beginning was mission furniture, which is what this is. And the Stickley brothers were the ones who began the style of furniture, and Nunn was quite taken with it. This piece here happens to be a signed piece uh, across the back behind here is the signature of Gustav Stickley, one of the Stickley brothers. And this, uh, this sofa goes clear back to the beginning. It, it could even have been at the Olmsted plant in Provo as well. But uh, a recent estimate of its worth now is about $35,000. It would be more than that if this one slat down there hadn't been kicked out by somebody. But uh, but it's, it's a wonderful piece, it's solid oak. And my fear is that someone is going to decide one day to refinish it and uh, one swipe of the sander back here and uh, the, the stickly name is gone. So I hope nobody will ever do that. And then the sewing machine here, it's one of the very first electric sewing machines. And I took it into town to see if they could restore it and the motor is just totally frozen up. There's just no way uh, to restore it. But it, it has a little light here. You can see that it's been well used over the years, or maybe mice have gotten into it, who knows. But anyway, there's another uh, treadle sewing machine, and it's in the foyer here. And it, I did have it restored, and it works beautifully. I learned to sew on a treadle machine, and so I enjoy using that. This is the laboratory, and it is just the same size as the classroom that we just came out of. Most of the equipment and so forth in here is new. Um, it's set up so that uh, the blackboard slides. There's a, there's a screen that comes down, hides many sins behind here. I won't show you what's there. And. Uh, Herb Reich, who was the class of 1917, uh, gave $20,000 to Deep Springs in order to equip the new lab. He used to come back every summer and spend the entire summer repairing everything here at Deep Springs. He lived to be 101 and died in New Hampshire recently. He didn't want any recognition for, uh, for the money. He wanted just to say that this is in memory of the class of 1917. He was a scientist himself and was the inventor of the cathode ray tube, which, uh, as most of you know, goes, uh, is what made television possible. This slab of wood here, uh, or laminated slab, is original to the 1917 museum that was built and we were very adamant about keeping that and incorporating it back into the, the new museum. And Deep Springs has one of the finest geology rock collections around. Uh, every professor that we've had come and teach geology remarks on how extensive it is and how really, really good it is. And these cabinets here are also original to the building and they're uh, they were made originally to hold rock samples. They're just full of them, all kinds of uh, petrified bones, you name it, it's in here. And then the cupboards over on the other side of the room are also filled with, many of them filled with other geological samples. Okay, leaving the lab, we have one more thing here before we go into the music room. Every place that I've ever known, of course, has its skeletons in the closet, and Deep Springs is no exception. And this one is, uh, has been around for a very long time. It has been used in the physiology classes for many, many years. He should have a name. I don't know if he does or not. This uh, is the music room. and. We started to, the original plan was to have a music room in the basement of the main building and when the, the side of the basement caved in and they had to build the walls much thicker in order to keep it from caving in again, that room ended up 
being too small, and so it is used for something else now. Uh, recently, we had a donor who donated some very high quality electronic equipment to the Deep Springs student body. And uh, there's a number of students who are very proficient in, in this kind of music. And they spend many hours over here. And last year we had every uh, Sunday night, they would invite any members of the community to come in and listen to what they had composed. And this piano over here was donated uh, in, oh, probably a couple of years ago. And it was donated by a woman in Bishop who owns the television station there. Her name is Bennett Kessler. And the drum set, which you can see right here, is well used as well. It belonged to Michael Pijos, class of 99. And Michael, in the beginning of his second year, was killed tragically in an accident up on Gilbert Pass. Uh, not anything on the ranch, but he rolled a tractor on himself when he was trying to get a car he'd gotten stuck out. And his parents left uh, his drum set for the student body, and they love it. They're often combos, different years, different students have different proficiencies in uh, various, with various uh, instruments, and so they'll put together a number of different kinds of uh, groups and the drums always come in handy. We have one professor, David Arndt, who, when he gets just stir crazy in his office, comes over here and beats on the drums for a little while. And so it has therapy value also. We're in the reading room of the library now, and there are a number of pieces in here that have historic value to Deep Springs. The building was originally built in 1917, and this was at the height of the, of the mission furniture, the prairie style, Frank Lloyd Wright style, and the buildings are, are built in that prairie style and also were furnished with a lot of the, the mission furniture of the period. The table is new, although it is a mission style. We had it built to our specifications. There is one identical to this in the conference room, which is called the nun room. Uh, this couch right here, sofa, is belonged to L.L. Nunn. And there are many photographs of Nunn around the building. And he is sitting here with his hand here on this sofa. And it was for a long time in the dormitory. And we had one student that said if he ever came back and this was not in the dormitory, he would burn it down. But when it needed to be reupholstered, then uh, I talked to the students and asked if we could put it in a more public place where people, everyone in the community could enjoy it. And the students thought that was a good idea and agreed to that. So it's here, the students sleep on it, it's well used and well loved. The, there are two chairs in this room like this. These also came out of the dormitory when we did the remodeling. And this had the original upholstery, very tattered, showing through the old horsehair stuffing that these were stuffed with. And I'm guessing that they do go back to the original purchase of the furniture for this building. This piece also, uh, I've seen it in photographs that uh, date back to the beginning of Deep Springs. And there was a lot of statuary around this guy has a heart on his butt, and uh, some of, it, of that is still in the dorm, the statuary. This couch here is a fainting couch, and L.L. Nunn had tuberculosis, and in his later years it was very difficult for him to stand or sit for a long time, and it was also difficult for him to lay flat. So this was a compromise where he could still carry on conversations and rest at the same time and be elevated enough for his lungs to work somewhat. This is another favorite of the students. They love to nap on it. Uh, they will work way into the night and sometimes come in the next morning and there are, there's a student asleep on, on one of these sofas. The chair over in this corner, over there, 
is also original to the building and the leather itself is is the original leather it has never had to be to be reupholstered this couch was donated it's a period piece and was donated to the college by Jeff Pope it was an old family piece of his and also there's a little table in the corner here this little table also shows up in some of the early photographs there are a lot of old pictures and paintings and so forth around Deep Springs in various degrees of repair and disrepair. And I've been slowly trying to uh, clean them up and rehang them. I haven't bothered to, to remap them or anything like that because I think there is a character that shows how old they are by having those little dust streaks uh, behind the glass in this one. This painting is by um, California artist Marie Kendall. It's an early 20th century painting of very typical landscape of early California. And uh, I assume has been here for a very long time. Okay, we're in the archive now. This is something that is new to this building. We never had an archive as such before. There were piles of old documents. There were boxes of old documents stored up in what we call the block house, which is a cinder block house on the edge of the circle. Uh, this work was all done by three students in successive years. When we decided to have an archive room, I invited a friend of mine from Independence, Missouri, who had, was a retired archivist who had been over a small archive. Uh, and I invited her to come out to Deep Springs and help us set up a professional archive, which she did. And she's worked, and then she has since come back, and she's worked with the three students who have done all of the the cataloging and and processing of of the work you see here. The first was was Keith Sweet, and then was Meyer Knorr, and then most recently Max Gasner. What they've done is. Uh, catalog and put into folders all of the old student body min minutes, all of the old TDS minutes, and uh, a number of collections including the Bob Aird collection and most recently Jack Newell's papers. Then the shelves in this room are new on this side. On this side they're original and these are some of Nunn's books that he had in his personal library and some of them also were in the library at the Olmsted power plant in Provo, Utah. And we've had to move some of them out to make new room for more archival material. And, and we will find new homes for these as, as this continues, this whole process continues. These books over here in, in these barrister bookcases are also part of Nunn's book collection. And this is an original cabinet to the, uh, to the college, and it houses uh, various odd-sized documents, some photographs and so forth. The photographs are all being scanned onto a computer so that they'll be more easily accessible to anyone who is interested in them. We're in the library now, the main part of the library. Ellie Gosen is our librarian who keeps track of 24,000 books and orders new books uh, constantly and culls old ones. And she's been a terrific help in, in keeping this place in order and, and, keeping, uh, and keeping the library fresh and up to date. The stacks are down through this way. At, at the end of the stacks, there are three carrels, two on this side and one on this side, where students can go and study. There are Russian propaganda posters all along here that were part of the Alice and Kurt Vergel uh, collection, and they donated them to us and one of the students with his mother. Which student was it? Uh, it was, I think, that Pete or whatever. Oh, Philip, Philip and, and his yeah, Philip Keep and his mother Katinka were the ones who framed all of these and hung them in here, and they're really quite fun and uh, the translations on the back of each one of them. Uh, the other thing that's meaningful to me in here is this memorial to Dave Mossner, David Campbell Mossner, 
who was a deep springer of 63 and was killed in Vietnam. And his parents and classmates and friends raised the money to construct uh, a wing of the library, a new wing of the library, a number of years ago. That wing of the library is now uh, offices and a guest room, but we moved the memorial to him in here. And this is the computer room where faculty and students can come to get their emails. Some of the faculty homes have email going to them, some do not. And uh, it's used almost around the clock as students stay up late at night doing papers and book reviews and various uh, things, but mostly I think they're on the email uh, communicating with family and friends and girlfriends. This is the classroom. This particular space was originally part of the library and it went from here on out with an extra wing uh, out to the north. And this table was once in the museum and then finally was just stacked with a bunch of other old stuff up in the green shed and one of the students refinished the base and then I took it to town and had a new top put on it that would be a little bit more student proof and it's uh, proved to hold up really well. These chairs were boarding house chairs um, at least in the 50s probably uh, the 40s and 50s and there were still a number of them around in various uh, stages of repair and disrepair and so we pulled those out and had them all refinished and repaired as well. And one of the things that I've tried to do while I've been here is uh, several times we've had really fine art painting teachers and uh, I have tried to get students to give a piece of their work that they have done and Elliot Michelson did this uh, painting right here, which I really like with the cowboy hat and, and the books and so forth and the, the spaces that he's created in, that, in this particular painting. And there are several other student paintings around in the guest rooms and other places as well. This is the student committee room and it's where the applications committee meets and it's where the uh, curriculum committee meets. The curriculum committee is in charge of hiring faculty members and choosing the courses and so forth that the students take and of course the applications committee is self-explanatory. But this table was originally a library table. It's solid walnut and it is just really beautiful. When I found it in the green shed it was just beat up and covered with dust and my stuff and everything else and it was, this was the only place that I could think of to put it, but it was a little bit too long. It was a foot longer than it is now, and this is not a very big room. So I had uh, Fendon's Furniture, who did all of the refinishing of the furniture in, in Bishop. So I had him cut six inches off each end, and the old doors in the original building had cut glass doorknobs, and Iris Pope the office manager collected all of those that she could and had them displayed in one of the cabinets in the in the office. So I took those one time and she didn't seem to miss them and so I had uh, my son-in-law Keith McEwen mount those crystal doorknobs on one of the these walnut slabs for a coat rack and then we gave that to the popes for, uh, for a housewarming gift when they moved into their house after it had been thoroughly renovated as well. And this desk here is one of many, many desks that we found uh, all over the place. Some of them were in the green shed. They were in various offices, various um, faculty houses and so forth. And I had them all refinished and refurbished, glued back together. Sometimes it was putting a new drawer front, as is the case here on this one, missing a drawer. And, uh, but they were all restored and they are all in use now in various places around the college. 
This is the main office, and when we finished the building and I took account of all the desks, we were minus about three or four desks. So we decided to have new ones put in this room and to have them all be from the same company. And so they all look like they may be, could be old, but they're not. But what is old in here are these filing cabinets. And these house the students' applications and their individual files through, from the beginning, from 1917. They're alphabetically distributed in here now, but any st former student can come back and find their file and look at it to see what, uh, what they said in their original application. This is the president's office. Currently, that's uh, Jack Newell, and soon it will be Ross Peterson's. But it was originally L.L. L. Nunn's office, and the fireplace was original to the building, the tiles and everything. When they rebuilt the building, they stripped all the tiles off and, uh, and stored them, and uh, the mantelpiece as well, and uh, then re-laid them on, on around the fireplace opening. This table here is also original to the building, and it could well be a stickly piece that had been refinished before, and uh, we had it redone again, and unfortunately the leather had to be replaced on the top. The desk was L.L. Nunn's desk, and it was in one of the faculty houses, and we didn't even know that the, that the drawer, drawer pulls were silver plated. They were just black when, when we pulled it out. So it's a beautiful desk. It's as lovely on the back side as it, as it is on the front side. These beautiful cloisonne vases with uh, all inlaid and uh, with these wonderful geese diving and frolicking in it uh, were also original to the building. The very earliest pictures of the main room have these on the mantel in, in the main room, the fireplace mantel. Uh, they're now in the office of the president. And then, uh, again, we have the old filing cabinets, the old barrister bookcases, and this chair had a little table that matches it that's in the office, and this has been retained on the back, but uh, it goes clear back to the beginning. There are early photographs that have this in it. This picture up here is uh, it's a drawing that Frank Lloyd Wright did for a house for Martin Satchi, who was the mechanic here in the early 20s. And Martin Satchi was engaged to a woman in Los Angeles, and he was a German immigrant. He wrote and spoke quite well in English, and he wrote all of these letters to, to his fiancée. She wanted a house before she would marry him and move up into this lonely part of the desert. And so he was constantly badgering L.L. L. Nunn to, to build him a house. At the time, he was living in the back of the ranch house, which is down at the lower ranch and, and the ranch manager, Jeff Pope, lives in. But one day, he, in one of his letters, which we have in the archives, he said, there's an architect here. He came with Mr. Johnson, and he's a real architect. Well, the real architect was Frank Lloyd Wright, and Mr. Johnson was A.M. Johnson, who built Scotty's Castle. And apparently he had a friendship with Wright, and perhaps was trying to get him to design some, some buildings for him on his own place over in Death Valley. But Satchi asked him if he would design a house for him, and he said, Frank Lloyd Wright said he would and that he would send him the plans. Well, the plans never came, and never came, and never came. And so then Martin went over to Death Valley, and he was probably just to socialize with A.M. Johnson. And Johnson had been trying to get Martin to go over and work for him to leave Deep Springs. And he was quite taken with, with the kind of work that Satchi could do and how thorough and good he was. And so he had been pressuring him to come over. So in a conversation that they had, Martin asked A.M. Johnson if he had, if he knew anything about the plans that Frank Lloyd Wright was going to do for a house for him. And he said, oh yes, he finished them when he was here. 
But I told him there was no sense in him sending them over to Deep Springs because you would be coming over here to work for me. And Satchi informed him that he had no intention of coming to work for Johnson in Death Valley. He was perfectly happy at Deep Springs. So this was totally lost to history until a number of years ago, someone ran into a calendar of Frank Lloyd Wright drawings. And this one showed up on one of the pages. And it was hanging in the office when we remodeled the whole calendar and was way, way out of date a number of years. And so I took the page that had this drawing on and had it framed and now it hangs in here. The original plans are in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Then there's a picture on the wall over here. This picture was painted by Walder King somebody. The signature on the picture is not clear. And the date is not clear e either, but it, it goes back probably very early in Deep Springs history. It's of the Lake Mountains. And when I got here, the paint, it's painted on uh, some kind of a board that's slick and the, and the paint was starting to chip off of it in a number of places. And since I'm an oil painter myself, I got out my paints and was able to restore the damaged places. From the beginning of Deep Springs history up until the advent of audio tapes and uh, CDs, the students bought records and the student body uh, taxed themselves to, to buy these records and they only bought classical music. And many of the older students who come back, the older alums who come back, ask where the records are. Well, here is where they are. They're no longer in the main room where they were for many, many years. <clears throat> but many of the students come down. This is what they call the time shack in here. And uh, there are records that clear back 78s and then the 33 and a thirds, many, many albums of them. And many of the students enjoy coming in here and listening to these records. We've tried to, to keep them in order and keep them clean and safe for uh, generations to come. This is not an old record player. It's, it's a new one, that, but it does pay, play the 33 and a third records. And so it doesn't have great speakers, but we're hoping that at some point we can get an addition of uh, a new turntable and speakers, not necessarily new, but used, that will do the same thing in better quality. This is the main room, and it's really the heart of the Deep Springs community. It's where we have all of our community meetings and where uh, the students have student body meeting and where we have all kinds of uh, entertainment by the students. And it's a place where students like to just come and relax. It originally was about eight feet narrower and the ceiling wasn't open. It was uh, only about as high as the rail around the top. The painting behind me here is, was commissioned by L.L. Nunn and P.N. Nunn, who were the engineers of this power plant here. And it was the first power plant on the ca Canadian side that uh, produced our alternating current electricity uh, for Buffalo, New York. The power plant produced power until 1998, and it was decommissioned at that time. So it had a long life of almost 100 years. And the holes here where the water comes out are now observation tunnels where you can go through and be right next to the falls and get soaking wet under the, under the falls there. There's a kind of a funny story about how this ended up in the main room. It was probably moved here at the time that L.L. Nunn built the school, and, but it ended up in the green shed. There was just no place big enough to hang it. And when my husband taught here in the mid-60s, I saw it up there, and it was leaning against the wall the front, the glass side against the wall. And I kind of crawled underneath and rubbed on the glass to see what in the world this huge thing was. And by golly, there was a, some kind of a watercolor painting underneath there. 
And then it's been rediscovered over the years, and uh, people, I guess, have cleaned it up from time to time. But we had an orderly who, whose job it was to keep the, all of the public spaces clean, who decided to redecorate the main building, and he got nine students to carry this up here. So it sat on cinder blocks here for the next two years. Then when we were trying to decide if it should go in here or not, there was a big debate with the trustees and the students. And as and the students finally said, yes, I think we think it should go into this building. So my husband Jack and uh, Carson Thorine were refinishing the frame on it. We never opened it up or cleaned the inside. There's a few bugs in there, but not very many. It's in remarkably tightly sealed. But they were refinishing the frame up in the green shed. And Jack said, what do you think, Carson? Do you think this ought to go back in the main room and go in the main room? And he said, well, I don't particularly like it, but it's always been there, so I think that's where it should be. And Jack said, do you know how long always is? And Carson said, what do you mean? And he said, two years, that's how long it had been up here. This photograph over the mantel is by Galen Rell, who is a world famous outdoor photographer and uh, was killed landing uh, in a small plane in Bishop two years ago in 2001. It was donated to the school by Ron Alexander, who was a Deep Springs alum of 1964. And it, it pictures the bristlecone pines and then looks over onto the summer rangeland for the Deep Springs cattle. It's a particularly appropriate photograph to have at Deep Springs. It's not only pictures the bristle cones, but our, our grazing allotment as well. Again, I went back into the archives to look for photogra early for photographs of the room, and there were oriental carpets on the rug, there, was, there were uh, leather couches and other, other leather chairs, and there were, of course, the mission style couches too. The, this is not new, it's, it's a reproduction. The speaker lectern here goes clear back to the very beginning too. And a few years ago, Jack and I had that re-glued and, and refinished. It was just swaying back and forth every time anyone tried to stand in back of it. And so we did that as a Christmas present for the student body. The fireplace is the same has the same tile that the one in Nunn's office has, and it too was stripped clear off and then replaced after the building was rebuilt. This chair here is one of the original pieces, and when we first came, it was in such terrible shape that we decided something needed to be done with it, and we were debating because there was just no money to do anything, and we were just cutting corners everywhere. So we were debating whether or not to have it redone in leather. And one of the students came, by, came up to us and said, if you will reupholster these two chairs, and there's another one over here that I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, if you will reupholster these two chairs in leather, I will pay for it from what's left of my student body account. And so we have this nice leather on these wonderful old chairs. We're really fortunate to have this beautiful Steinway piano, grand piano. A few years ago, we had a Withrow speaker, Harvey Mansfield, Jr., who came for a week to give uh, lectures and to integrate into the student body and so forth. His father had uh, been a student here in the early 20s and then later became um, a member of the Board of Trustees. And so he was familiar with Deep Springs, but I was showing him through the building and we walked into this room and he just stopped and he looked at the piano and he said, that's my mother's piano. And she had been a gifted pianist and had played often at Deep Springs when uh, her husband was uh, on the board of trustees. And when she died, uh, the family decided to donate her piano to Deep Springs. And Dick Dawson, who still teaches music here at Deep Springs, uh, lives uh, near Bishop, California, had rebuilt the piano at the time that it 
it was donated to Deep Springs and has since rebuilt it a second time and he comes out often to tune it and to keep it in in good shape so uh, we're very fortunate to have it. We just moved the piano from the far corner of the room over to this corner because the sun from the skylight was hitting it and it can, that can damage it. We also have to have a humidifier on it because it is so extremely dry in this temperature and so we're very careful with it and uh, it, it serves us well. This little round table here, it's quite ornate, originally had a marble chessboard in the top of it and when we came it was long gone and it was sitting in our house with a great big plant on it and as I was looking through the archives I found a 1918 photograph of a professor and a student sitting at this table playing chess and they were sitting out on the main porch. Then the square table here is also very old and, and goes back to the original Deep Springs. It was in the library when we came here and just very rickety. It had some card catalogs on it and if you opened a card catalog drawer it just kind of rocked back and forth. But it uh, refinished very nicely. In the early 1930s Charles Collingwood was a student here. He later became a CBS uh, correspondent and was part of the famous Walter Cronkite team and was a foreign correspondent. In the 1960s he donated his art collection to Deep Springs and this painting here is one of those. We don't know much about it. Uh, there were about 15 or 20 paintings. A lot of them over the years have uh, disappeared or not been taken care of which happened uh, during several periods of Deep Springs history. But um, they have been very important in, in uh, the decorating of the main room and other rooms at Deep Springs for, for many, many years. And this one does still survive. Actually, there are two preliminary drawings that go with this that we have as well. Also in the Charles Collingwood collection were a number of artifacts, Mesoamerican artifacts, uh, that are in various places around the college and there are a selection of them here and uh, they're quite interesting and uh, we've enjoyed having those. This wonderful little chair here is the other one that uh, goes clear back to the beginning of the school and that Carson Thorine so graciously gave us the money to reupholster it in leather and it's just a, a wonderful piece and we're just so glad we've got it. The paintings on the wall are by Christian Mijo who taught here in the 1930s and the stories are that he was certifiably crazy, uh, that he was a, a paranoid schizophrenic and, and it was kind of strange sometimes having him around and uh, caused a lot of tension but he was a wonderful painter and this particular painting is of Cucamonga Mountain in Cucamonga Canyon just over the this range to the east from us and if you drive down that canyon now which you can it's very recognizable then this table here is also pictured in some of the very first photographs that we have of Deep Springs. And the lamp, I have no idea how old it is, but it, it works now. I had it rewired and it's, it's very old itself, but, uh, but I don't know exactly how old. When I went searching for oriental rugs, I soon discovered, if I hadn't known before, how expensive they were. So I was invited to go to India by a friend and I went and was able to get the two red rugs in, in the middle here of the main room and the two red rugs by the door. The kiln on the wall over here was given to the college by Jeff Johnson who's the current chair of the board and Jeff had gone to was on his way to Mecca and bought this along the way it's very very old 
and it's, it's really quite beautiful and as you can see, very much handmade because it, it, it is so crooked. And Peter O'Connor, who, who was the architect for the restoration of this building and also all of the restoration of Deep Springs, got these, these three rugs along here in the browns and oranges uh, up in Seattle, and they're very lovely too. I realize that it affects the resale value of antiques to refinish them, but we don't, didn't have any intention of reselling any of this stuff. We wanted it to be here at Deep Springs to be in good repair and, and to be very usable and functional because it's always been used by the students and by the community, all of these wonderful antiques, and we wanted that to continue. So that was our goal when I decided to, to refinish all of these. 